everyone good morning it's my pleasure to welcome you all to this live session my name is krishna kumar and i'm part of emerge way academy as part of a public program series uh, we have brought unique topics to you in the past like design thinking leadership fundamentals quality health safety environment and many more topics today uh, we have this very relevant topic uh that i'm sure is relevant to all of us especially during this trying times we're very pleased to bring this program to you all jointly with high path i appreciate your interest in the program and thank you for taking time to be present here i will be your moderator today and let's let's uh, uh you know talk about a few points before we get started i request you to keep your microphones muted at all times Uh, so we have as little disturbance as possible during the program we have allocated specific time for taking all your questions and we'll do so during the end of the session however you can leave your questions on your chat space as and when it appears to them uh you know i will compile all the questions in the end of the session and we'll address them later so let me introduce inba our facilitator for today Inba Sekaran Shivaraman Inba as we call him is a veteran in the area of organization development which he has been practicing and consulting for the last about 30 years. He started his career with Larsen and Trubro as a management trainee and later after a good stint in the Murugappa group where he headed the corporate HR for Tube Investments of India He set up his consulting firm for organizational development initiatives and leadership development in 1996. He is qualified executive coach and relationship coach from International Coach Foundation. He is trained in group relations from Tavistock Institute UK, an accredited consultant from Team Management Systems Australia. and a licensed practitioner in developing relational capital from relational analytics uk he has consulted for top management teams in philips hewlett packard anz grindley stanchart amar raja gmr and many many more he has consulted for organizations in the apac region china usa and the other parts of the world he carries with him about 40 years of corporate experience and i welcome inba uh, to start the session over to you inba thank you kk good morning to all of you uh, i really appreciate the sort of investment that you've decided to make in yourself this morning and being a weekend you've taken time off your precious two and a half hours and uh, i really appreciate and thank you for that uh, when i think of leadership and it's something very mystical is a feeling that comes in to me because the sort of power that leaders uh, have you know uh, be it a charismatic power or you know aristocratic uh, uh, you know uh, authoritative power the thing is the sort of influence that you have on people organizations and the society is phenomenal okay now especially in this time of uh, pandemic and when severe changes are going through uh, you know your challenges are pretty heavy now with that in mind you know for for some time this thought has been going on in me so design this work managing performance in a changing paradigm before i start you know i would like to start with a parable which has been fascinating to me maybe for the last when i first read it, it was 1988 so you can calculate almost 32 years uh let me start sharing the screen and then i'll get into the okay yeah now this is a parable i call the parable of prince chai this one I first read in the Harvard Business Review, and it's ever fresh in my memory. This is about uh, Chao Wu, was the emperor of China many many years ago, and he had his uh, son, who was apparently to take over from Chao Wu. His name was Chai, 
And uh, now Chawa was about 70 years old and uh, he was very weak in his body. And then what happened is uh, uh, people started getting worried because Chawa was such a nice leader, such a nice king, beloved, a household word of every family in China. And they were getting worried how the young prince is going to be, whether he'll be as good as the father. And this worry was, you know, conveyed to the king, uh, to the emperor, Chao. So he thought very deeply about it. And then he calls Chai and says, uh, Sonny, I want you to learn a little more on leadership. And I have spoken to uh, Mung, the sage in the forest. You know, he lives by the mountainside. There's a huge tree over there and you can find him over there. So please go and meet him. So Chai bows before his father and then goes over uh, on his horse deep into the forest. And there just before the sunset, he finds this grand old man with a long beard and a flowing hair, all gray and white. Uh, wisdom, you know, uh, is shining from his face. And Chai bows before him. And then Monk says, yes, Sonny, come. Dad sent word to me about what I need to do. And he said, Sonny, you go into the forest and listen to the sounds of the forest and come back. And uh, this guy was nonplussed. You know, he had a smirk, didn't show it in the face. He said, what this guy is trying to say? I've been in the forest so many times. I used to come here for hunt hunting. You know, almost from my youth up, I have been over here. What is he trying to say? And uh, with a bit of a disgust, he turned around, you know, mounted on his horse, and with an air of, uh, you know, uh, arrogance, he left that place. He goes into the forest, and within a day, he returns and tells the monk, Oh, sage, I've listened to all the sounds of the forest, and I can tell you the sounds. And the sage says, Tell me, my son. And uh, he says, You see, I could. Hear the roaring of the lion, the howling of the wolves, the gurgling of the water brooks, the rustling of the leaves, and chirping of the birds. And as he was saying, Mung was shaking his head, you know, in disapproval. And Chai's list was getting smaller and smaller, and he could see no sign of acknowledgement in the face of Mung. And then the list was exhausted. Mung still shook his head and said, Sonny, you have not listened to the sound of the forest. Can you go back? Listen to the sound of the forest and come back. And this time, you know, Chai was completely confused. He was very humble. He didn't know what exactly he meant. All this arrogance was lost now. Uh, with a crouched shoulder, he just mounted on his horse and trotted slowly into the forest. Days turned into weeks and weeks into months, but he could not listen to the sound of the forest. All the sound that he heard was just the apparent sound. And he got so worried, so worried. And then, you know, his fingernails started growing, his beard started growing, his hair started growing. And he was, you know, in utter humility, not knowing what to do. He can't get back to the kingdom because he's gone into the forest to get trained and he can't come from an incomplete course. Uh, many, many days goes by, and in total exasperation one day, he just lies down under a tree and says, my God, what is this? And there was a total emptying of himself, and then suddenly he heard the sounds. He said, my God, is this the sound that the monk had been telling? It's so beautiful. It's so wonderful. Where have I been? How did I lose all this? And he listened and listened and listened. And finally, he said, I think it's time to go and meet Mang. And this time, when he went towards a Mang, there was a lot of humility in his countenance. You know, his face shone with that revelation. He went and sat before Mang. And then he said, oh, great Mang, I have listened to the sound of the forest. And Mang said, I can see that, Sonny, on your face. Okay, tell me the sound. And he said... Great monk, I could listen to the beautiful sound of a bud blossoming into a flower. I could hear the early morning dew 
or the green grass drinking in the early morning dew. I could hear the tender sunlight, early morning sunlight again, falling on the green leaves, and he went on and on. And Mang shook his head in approval, and he said, yes, my son. You know, kingdoms are destroyed. Organizations are destroyed. Families are destroyed. When leaders hear what everybody hears, see what everybody sees, and say what everybody says. But countries, organizations, families prosper when leaders are able to see the unseen, hear the unheard, and articulate the inarticulated. Again, I say, here, countries, organizations, and families prosper when the leaders are able to see the unseen, hear the unheard, and articulate the unarticulated. And he said, blessed him and said, the kingdom will prosper in your hands because you got the wisdom and Chai returned. Now, this looking back for ourselves, you know, as leaders, you know, there's a lot to learn from this. Like, it talks about the awareness. I mean, we get lost so much into the day-to-day -day work, the work pressure. I mean, what is the time that we spend to see the unseen, hear the unheard, and uh, you know, articulate the unarticulated? Uh, if you look back, I'm not going to get into the deep depth right now. I'll see that later. Even about this COVID, the pandemic, you know, those who could see the unseen, it was written there. Now, who, those who could hear the unheard, could, the sound was already there. I'll give you some evidence a little later. But as leaders, how many organizations did something about it? Now, it's a question to stay with. So just keep this in mind. And, uh, you know, the sort of work that leaders have to do themselves, you know, it's very helpful. Yeah. You know, when you're all alone in an attitude of meditation, the sort of thoughts that this can evoke is phenomenal. I have been harboring this parable for the last 32 years. Okay, so I thought I'll stop with this. Now, before we get into the main course, I just thought I'll touch base with you all. You know, we'll have a small breakout session. Uh, uh, let me know. KK, how many are there? Participants? Uh, we, have, we have three groups with three each. <laughs> okay, fine. Great. So what I want you to do is just capture your existential struggle. How I'll say what struggle is. Currently, uh, currently in your organization, at your level, I see about, when I saw the list, there are at least seven CEOs and uh, six top management uh, participants over here. Now, you just look at your organization and your role. What are the major problems that because you? I just like you to identify just one, just one. And in your breakout session, now just share that one problem. And among the three, I would request one person to be a coordinator. And we, when you're back into the main room, you know, you share what your team had shared, right? So you will identify what are the major problems or say, what causes you, you to lose your sleep? You know, what is that? So that one issue, pick up just one issue from that and share it within your group of three. One person, right at the start, you nominate who's going to be a coordinator. And that person makes a note. And there could be similar problems or there could be varied problems, different problems. But back into the main room, you will share with the rest of the others. And after get into the um, seminar as such. Okay. Over to you. Okay. Should I yeah. stop sharing? Uh, no, I mean, we can get into the breakout session. You, you can just be there. Yeah. Okay. Can you quickly start sharing just a minute for each? Just give your name and then start off. Who's going first? Uh, hello, uh, let me. Uh, yeah. Murli, Murli uh, yeah. KGK. Yes, Murli, please go ahead. Yeah, uh, myself and uh, Rajendran sir will, uh, were there together. The uh, single biggest thing is uh, uh, the uh, uncertainty. Uncertainty, okay. 
uncertainty and of course uh, communication in terms of uh, team management multiple things are there revenue uh, cost cutting uh, yes, multi- i think these are uh, common for all the organizations as on date the single biggest uh, challenge uh, is the uncertainty that we are facing and the uh, keeping the team motivated in the middle of uh, uncertainty this so uh, leadership is the uh, single biggest uh, challenge okay thank you thank you, thank you. thanks please next uh, hi this is praveen yeah praveen please uh my and uh, manu shared a discussion and uh, we yeah. feel that uh, the decision making is the one uh, pain area uh, it takes a lot of time in uh, t- uh, b- b- taking the decisions uh, by the uh, senior people in the company the that is uh, taking a lot of time and uh, it, it involves a lot of effort so mm. that's uh, that's a part that uh, uh, the... okay thank you thank you next okay i this to be here yes yeah, so uh, so uh, we had a wonderful introduction between anand sakti uh, and myself okay i think the uh, um, uh, one of our uh, team members uh, also highlighted and we were bang on that uh, mm-hmm. how do we take control of uncertainty uh, as a fundamental leadership challenge okay. uh, in this current times essentially you know while uh, while the uh, issues remains uh, similar uh, while the team coping up with the uh, new needs um uh, 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 on a broader part you know essentials what should be the essentials uh, which we should be steering in our businesses um uh, at a time when uncertainty is there and take control of things and look at uh, as an opportunity uh, internally and externally okay sakti sakti and anant you want to add anything No, I, I think your one minute is roughly unless it's very important. Please add. Ah, uh, yeah, I think I think we are fine. Yeah, for whatever uh, Subir was uh, mentioning, I think we are in agreement with. Uh, yes. Okay, okay. We are fine. We are fine with that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any more? Uh, this is uh, Shrini. Uh, I wasn't able to join the team four. Uh, so quickly on that. Um, a note one is about agility uh, uncertainty is always there but um, it's almost about 9 months we have lost uh, due to this uncertainty and uh, we have to catch up on the next remaining year so we have a progressive plan for the next 3 years how mm. do we catch it up in the next 2 years is something that we are looking at fine so, so uh, krishna yeah uh, in fact actually this is murugan uh, sorry our group like we just had an introduction and then time got over so <laughs> we couldn't discuss really uh, is there any possibility another 5 minutes we can get <laughs> then you'll be losing out on the substance of the seminar okay uh, that's okay the rest of the other team could i share uh... yeah please yeah so yeah. this is same sender uh, my group members were uh, uh, satish and santosh so three yeah. points were shared uh, like uh, the critical point like uh, the leaders went is uh, keep like, keeping on same page with uh, colleagues so that has been uh, the challenge in the pandemic times the second okay. point is like the business uh, has come down uh, 30 to 40% so how to cope up uh, with the stakeholders and uh, yeah uh yeah that is one uh, critical challenge and uh, the most importantly uh, we understand the worst has come but uh, the how to uh, uh, like uh, take guard and uh, uh, forecast uh, forecast the future so that is uh, the Into most the critical yeah so unseen has uh, oh. yeah yeah so these uh, three thank points you. are discussed in brief thank you in brief thank you thank you there's been one more team no? yeah two more teams two more teams oh yeah there's one more team yeah right who's the other team i think i think we uh, i must admit we we also lost all the time in just introducing each other i don't think we came to the point anita uh, and uh, uh, durai and manohar 
the river not deep, but yeah, we just ran out of time. I'm sorry. Okay, okay. What would be your issue, the calculus, if you were to say? Okay. Um, yeah, if I were to, if I lose sleep, in in my industry, it is mainly uh, due to the challenges one faces every day in keeping, you know, the, the staff morale up and keeping the the, the sub vendors and the clients uh, happy. In, in my view, that's the biggest challenge I face. Uh, and on top of that, making money out of out of the out of the business. Yeah. Uh, it, I, I work in the water industry, and I hope you guys can then connect to what exactly I said. We we are pulled in different directions by sub vendors, by contractors, by clients. Mm -hmm. So that's the biggest challenge, and that's the one that that makes me lose my sleep. If I okay. hope I Thank you, thank you. I'm stopping with this because we just have uh, an hour. Uh, my idea is to go till oh, all right till one o'clock. No. So one and a half hours I have. Um, around 11.45, we will have a five minute bio break or a coffee break. And then again, we will continue. Thanks for sharing. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So let me get back to my slide. Okay. Now, I'd like to quickly share the objectives with you. Now, this workshop was designed with in mind. Right? So, my assumption when I designed it, it was to the CEOs. But now, people who are attending, participants, you're also part of the CEO team as such, the Apex team. So, this holds good for both the, C the CEO and the CXOs. So with that in mind, the following objectives so would I quickly take you through the objectives. So the new paradigm of change is here to stay. You know, uh, as in the group with Shen, uh, I, I forget your name. Uh, you said, now it's all done. Now, how are we going to be careful about the future? Right? So things like this change is going to continue. And the, the change that is being caused by the pandemic is also to continue. So how do you as a leader at the top deconstruct this reality of change and manage performance? And so that'll be the first objective. And the second would be understand your performance as a CEO. What is your vantage level? See, this is very important. Huh? Um, you know, there are CEOs who are very open to this, and there are CEOs who are not very open to it. In the sense, if organization has to make a shift, you know, what is the shift that I have to initiate for the organization to move, which should be very personal to me, in my role, in my style, so that also has to be seen. So th there's one area that we look into, what is the vantage level from where the CEO has to operate his or her performance? then get an insight into what is holistic performance management. Most of the time when we say performance management, we end up with the performance appraisal or the goal setting, but there is a very holistic framework to it. You know, many organizations get stuck or many organizations um, start plateauing or decaying just because the organization does not have a holistic understanding of performance. So that is one area that we will be doing. And then managing the organization as an organic adaptive system. This is very important. Uh, uh, most of the time, because of the technology, we get into to dealing with the organization uh, as a mechanistic system. But the moment you realize this as an organic adaptive system, our approach is very different. And many successful organizations have done this. Okay. So managing organization is an organic adaptive system. How do, how do we do that? Very briefly, I'll be taking you through that. Then understand, I, I have created a sort of a, um acronym. So the spelling may be a little different, but I will address this as future. So understand how to future-proof 
your organization. So when I'm taking you through this construct of future, F-U-T-E-R, um, <clears throat> it will be a concept on how you equip yourself to uh, anticipate future and work on it. Right? The next will be the application of the concept. What are the essential application level responses? So that I have acronymed as war performance, right? So, which is the operationalization of your future proofing of the organization. Now, these will be the objectives. So your main takeaways will be at least three, if you go through this, you know, uh, holistic understanding of an organization. How do you work on holism to manage performance? The other one is how do you understand the organization as a socio-technical system, right? It's not purely a mechanistic system, but it's a socio-technical system. And then how it is an organic adaptive system. So these will be the major. And uh, uh, if you intently listen to it, there will be quite a bit of takeaways that you can take and apply to your organizations. But I wouldn't say that you're going to get the depth of it, but at least conceptually you'll be clear in terms of what you can do with your organization. And all, all these things which I'm presenting here are tested concepts. And now the webinar structure will be like this. Uh, there are two modules I'm going to take you through. The first module is giving clarity on understanding holistic performance. So the first session will deal with you as the CEO. Where do you stand at your performance? I mean, advantage level means you have a positional advantage. What are you doing with the positional advantage for enhancing the performance of the organization? The second is performance in a changing paradigm. When you design a performance management system, it has to be a system which will adapt change, which will invite change into the organization. It brings the outside inside. So how do you look into that? And the third is understanding the job performer. So most of the time, we take many things for granted uh, about the performer who's doing the job. But there is a specific flow that gets into the performer. We need to understand that. And when we are able to do that, organization's performance and productivity goes up. Even in changing paradigm, we need to have an understanding of how you design the performance job. Okay. So these three will be in the first module. The second module will be understanding organization as an organic adaptive system. So in session one, I'm going to take, I mean, both will also deal with how do you have a rapid organic response to what is happening outside, right? How, how do you uh, win the race in picking up the signals, putting it into the organization, and being ready for it? Right? So rapid organic response. So the first one is the conceptual one will be future-proofing your organization. And the second one, which will be application or the operationalization of the future-proofing which I'm calling it as war performance. So this will be the deliverables and this is the organization, I'm sorry, webinar structure we'll be going through, right? So we'll start off, uh, okay, before I start up, um, I had sent this, I don't know, the, uh, Central, this copy has been sent to the participants? Yes, yes, Senba. Okay, thank you. Thank you. If you have taken a copy of it, it'll be helpful for you as the work is progressing because we sent this in soft copy so you can edit it on your system itself. That is, uh, what are the, the areas you would like to work on, right? In each of the areas, in each of these sections, what is it that's hitting you? And what is your current level? What would you like to be having as your desired level and what you'd like to do about it? Because most of the time we attend seminars, we attend workshops, uh, you know, in a week's time, it's all evaporated, right? Now, if you go through this, you will be able to take decisions based on what you're going to listen to the next two hours. And on demand, if you want, I can send you the PPTs. And uh, further, if you would like to have a discussion, that also can be done. So if you could be an intentional participant and an intentional listener, you will definitely benefit from what's going to happen in the next uh, 90 to 100 minutes. Okay. Right. The module one, understanding holistic performance. Right. What is your positional advantage or the 
uh, the vantage level that you occupy in the organization. Uh, so you can just think of it and put an answer to it. But once I finish this session, you'll be clear in terms of what you can tell for yourself, your positional advantage, and what is your influence in the organization. Uh, this case study, I've written an article and I covered this case study in the article. That copy also has been sent. If you had the time, you would have read through this. Uh, otherwise, I'm quickly going through this whole thing. See, some time ago, there was a posting, a video which was uh, quite viral. A congresswoman by name uh, Katie Porter, you know, she really stumps JP Morgan uh, CEO, Jamie Dimon. What she tells her uh, is, what she tells him is, that, look, uh, I have a, a neighbor, you know, uh, she's a teller in your bank, and right? she's a single mother, and a very frugal budget she makes for every month, and every month she's in a deficit of $567. If I'm right, her salary is something like uh, a, li a little around $2,000 per month. So every month she's in a deficit of $567. And uh, what Ms. Porter says is, do you have any suggestions how she can handle her deficit? Actually, Mr. Diamond is really stumped. I mean, he had never thought about these things. And uh, he becomes a little defensive if you watch in that video, saying that I think uh, I have to think about it. So whatever Ms. Porter was saying, he just responds saying that I have to think about it. And then Ms. Porter says, if you want a suggestion, find a way to provide for families to make ends meet. Now, now my question is, if you had been Jamie Diamond, what would have been your response? Or at least when you came back home, what would you... Uh, what, what what's what's the what is it that I can do next time? Supposing a question like this comes, is there a way that I can work through it? That you can just take a minute to think about it. If you were Jamie Diamond, you know, uh, what would you have done? Right now, I have a model over here. This is. Understanding organization at levels of performance advantage, right? Now, if, if, if the top area is not worked, the next area is getting affected, the next area, next area. Most of the time, straight away, we get into strategic or we get into operational or tactical without looking much into the top one. So here, Dr. Gilbert Thomas, who is called as the father of performance technology, um, I, I had a chance of visiting his house, but the man had passed away before that. His wife also is a performance technologist, spent some time uh, with her, uh, a grand old lady. Now, they, it's written a book on human competence, engineering worthy performance. And there have been a lot of work taken out of this and a lot of consulting models have been developed. So one thing that fascinates me is to understand organizations how. So here it talks about philosophical level. You know, a philosophical level is the founder or the CEO, he has a philosophy for the organization, right? Now, what happens is we may have philosophy for products, we may have philosophy for processes, uh, uh, for people. Now, out of this comes values. Now, values become the component of at a cultural level. And the cultural level lends a scope for policies. You have product policies, you have people policies, you have customer policies which are all the statement of intent. Yeah. So if the above two are clear, the policy is clear, and then you have the strategy and all that. Now, in the place of diamond, what, what I would have thought is, right, now I have a policy which is bred out of a philosophy of ensuring good skills at the top level. I have a policy to say, what should be the perquisite levels and perquisites of the top management? Now, what should be their lifestyle and standard of living? Uh, then I will think, do I have an ideal or a philosophy? You know, the lowest paid employee in my organization, what should be her or his living standards? You know, at, at least I have it for myself and say that my lowest paid, like a driver who's working in my company, should be able to provide for 
a 5,000 rupee rental house, you know, should be able to send two children to school of this level and, you know, should be able to commute home and office in a two-wheeler and provide a budget for the groceries and all that so much house rental. Now, if I have that in mind, that becomes very clear for my compensation policy also as to how much I can give. Of course, it has to have a business feasibility to the whole thing. Now, but most of the organization have at the, for the top level, but does not have for the bottom level. If you put yourself from this vantage level, you have the scope of looking into the bottom level also, but uh, many organizations do not look. So my answer, if I were coaching Diamond, would be to work on these vantage level and ask them, what is your positional advantage from where you're operating? Can you attend to this? Because tomorrow, uh, Ms. Porter can come with another person and day after another, but you can't be answering for every person's budget. That's not your job. But can your philosophy, can, which turns into a policy to address people level compensation, can that be taken care of? So this is just to introduce that you are at a vantage level and how are you making use of your vantage level for the performance of the organization? I will just leave it at that place right? and I will move over to my uh, second session. Uh, this is actually the session two, I'm sorry. This one, what, what, what I'm trying to portray over here is, I'm going to capture organization life cycle. So you see a bottom a small line that grew in the slide, and that is the birth of an organization, right? And this is a story of any organization. So it is born, there is a starting time of any organization, right? Now, I'll just stop here. If I were to ask you to just quickly note down how many organizations are 100 years old? How many organizations you can name which are 100 years old? Uh, how fast are you able to write them down or recall in your memory? And I'm sure that there is a struggle, right? We may not be able to push beyond five or six. You're excellent if you've done 10. But my question is, were these the only organizations 100 years ago? So the answer definitely from you is no. Then what happened to the rest of the other organizations? And the answer is they are no more or they have died. So which comes to say organizations like an organism have a life cycle. So there is a birth, there is a growth. Then what happens is... That the moment plateauing comes, you know what is going to come after that if you do not take corrective action. There's a decline, and after that, you don't do, there is a decay, and the organization dies. Right. Now, sometimes in the 60s, there were discoveries made in social science and organization behavior that organizations like organism need not die they have the capacity to renew their, their selves if you do the right things at the right time. So this is what I'm going to show you. The organization has grown and, uh, and just when it's going to come at a tipping point to plateauing, when you're anticipating It was one of the earliest books by Rosabeth Beth Cantor. Beth Cantor, she called this as mounted S curve, right? the, the renewal process of organization, mounted S curve. Now, knowingly or unknowingly, you've been doing this if your organization has been alive for quite a long time. Now, these days, organizations' average lifespan has come to 15 years to 20 years. Only people who do these interventions, organizations start sustaining and growing. So you have these interventions to prevent the organizations from plateauing or declining. Okay. So this is a continuous process. So 
the CEO has to be very mindful of this. Okay, I'll give you some examples also as I proceed. I'm a performance man. Is the fundamental function of performance management. Now you need to take a look whether your organization performance management system is operating with a concept such as this. Right. So maintaining the organization in the mounted S curve, or to say that preventing the organization from plateauing or decaying. Right. That's the major role of the performance management system. Now we'll see what do you mean by these interventions and what are the interventions that you really look into. Right? The first uh, intervention I would say, staying relevant to the ecosystem in which you are doing business through proper strategies that combine the outside with the inside. Please note that down. Huh? Staying relevant to the ecosystem in which you are doing business through proper strategies that combine the outside with the inside. I'm going to give you some examples as I go ahead. A simple definition of business strategy would be from, from economist is how do you go from here to there after you have defined there. So the there should be relevant to the ecosystem. I'll graphically explain this to you. Now, your organization exists in what we call a macro social system. What do we mean that, by that? Now, your organization is surrounded by you know, vendors who supply customers, government rules, right? uh, social expectations, you, you know, the community around. Now, all these things are subsystems, social subsystems that are interacting with your organization. Now, each of the subsystems have their own subsystems interacting with that. Now, if you multiply and go and take a look at it, there is a big macro social system. And this is, owing to various reasons, constantly on the move. Now, if you do not understand this move, anticipate this move, and stay in tune with it through the strategy, what happens is, the blue is your organization. So you see here, it's inside the macro social system. When you do not strategize properly, what happens is you start staying where you are and the rest of the systems move forward. And there's this is one of the major reasons in which um, you know, plateauing takes place. So we need to constantly look at when we plan our strategies for the next one year, two year, three year, four year, how do we stay relevant to the ecosystem and then keep doing business? What happened? To organizations which did not anticipate this, I have some case studies I will share with you as we go on. So this is one thing, our strategy, what it should do. So what could be the, those things which influence in the macro social system to shift and make changes is your political sphere, your economic sphere, socio-cultural, technology, technological, and now we can also add on Nature's turbulence. Now you have the tsunami, you have earthquakes that happen, you know, pandemic. So this also is something to be strongly reckoned with. Therefore, your strategy should factor the impact of macro social system moves on your organization. Yeah. So and now, and now if you take for example, the whole organizational system made a big shift into work from home. If some organization said, I can't do this, then it's a definite plateau and a decay. So just one small example to quote. So there are many things that are happening which are apparent and there are things which are not apparent. That's where the leader should be able to see the unseen and hear the unheard. Now the next one is, once you have your strategy clear, it also is important how do you structure and a strategy aligned structure so that your organization is able to move. So many organizations, what happens is they have the strategy, but the structure to operate the strategy is not looked into. And this is a highly technical aspect and uh, very few organizations look into it. 
I can support this with an example. Uh, LMT construction. This really happened when I was working uh, 80s, 80, 81. I was there as a management trainee. And what happened in 1976, this LMT construction, which today is uh, you know, over one lakh crore, was a seven crore company. And a very dynamic CEO took over and he is seventy billion. It was a single point organization. It was just operating out of Chennai, yeah? and you know, business being made. Now, when this dynamic person came in, within four to five years, he so there was a load of seventy crores. And what he found was there was a sort of a wobbling. You know, the business could not. Uh, you know, the organization could not take and handle the business. Delays were there, you know, you know miscommunication were there. And when he called the consultant, uh, S.K. Bhattacharya uh, from IM Calcutta, he came, he made his diagnosis and said, uh, you, you know, Mr. Ramakrishnan, you have your uh, strategy very clear. You see the market, market opportunities, but your organization structure is not ready to take it in. You are a single location, and a small organization with not much bandwidth. So he came with the concept of decentralization. So the next is uh, I just give And, uh, you know, your structure can become an impediment to implement your strategy. So as a part of your performance management, after looking at strategy, are you also looking at the suitability of structures? Because I've seen, I have been working the close to 30 years with CEOs, and I've seen one of the favorite areas of CEOs is managing structures. They keep changing structures. But do we really have a basis and understanding of what structures do, right? So here it was a highly technical work and just a change in the structure created the business, you know, from seven crore, it went on to 150 crores. It was phenomenal. And now you know what it is. So at appropriate time, they kept on doing it because after doing the structure, they did a systems intervention, they did a people intervention, it went on and the organization just kept growing. So now the third intervention that is required is systems and processes. Once you put the structure, are the systems and processes designed to move and support the structure, which is supporting the strategy? Okay? Uh, this is an organization that I consulted for many years ago. Uh, they had fantastic strategies and beautiful market opportunities. It was a spice manufacturing multinational exporting to you know, the European countries, Japanese, and all that. Now, when a query comes, a query comes in like, you know, can you send us granularized ginger, right? Moisture level will be this one. The granular sizes will be this. The aflatoxin level will be this. This will be the variety. Now, the international response time for an inquiry such as this, those days, it was facts. When you send a fax, you respond to it in 48 hours. But this particular organization that I was consulting for, when I went and did my diagnosis, I found that they took eight days to respond. A simple thing that we did, the, the strategy was clear, the structure was fantastic, the processes did not fit in. When we re-engineered this whole thing, we found that in 24 hours, they had the capacity to respond. Right. So after your structure, you also have to look at your strategy, whether, I'm sorry, look, look at your processes, systems and processes, is it connecting to what the strategy has to deliver? So the third is your systems and processes. Now, finally, the last is people competencies. Now, after doing all this, if your people do not have the capacity or the capability to do it, I'm oh, sorry, the whole thing's thing fa falls apart. Now, we may, 
Uh, you know, I've, I've seen organizations which say, you know, we've done everything. We really worked on our strategies. We restructured systems and processes are designed well, but our people are not delivering, right? Now, that is the most crucial part. That's where you come to checking what is the gap in the performance, people competencies. Have you, when you say the organization is moving from point X to point, uh, point A to point B, who is moving? The, the performers, the people who are in the organization, they are the ones who are causing. But do they have the competencies clear or have the competencies been enhanced? Have, have you seen the gap? Have you seen the, um, the you know, what are the skills that are required? What are the attitudes that are required? So many times we miss out on this, creating a strategy relevant competencies. Okay, now I'll just take a look at this. Recently, I was consulting just before the pandemic for an organization, it's an agrochemical, 20 year old organization, 600 crores. Now, uh, for the last six years, they were stuck with just 600 crores. And then I did a diagnosis and they wanted to grow and led them through a strategy planning exercise. And I found that the, in, in another four years time, they could cross 1,000 crores or even less than that. But the top management, I mean, the, the, the promoters, founders, did not have the capacity or the competencies to understand what they have to do at the next level of competencies what they have to do for their own selves in terms of shifts that they have to make. And as a result, you know, I, I saw that the organization is still stuck, still stuck, that they are not able to make the move. So people competencies right from the top to the bottom becomes very important in this whole flow of intervention. So quickly to take a look at it, what we have covered is strategy, staying relevant to the ecosystem and our structure, making it aligned to the strategy, systems and processes which are aligned to deliver the strategic results through the strategy aligned structure. And then finally, we come to the people as such. Now I'd like to emphasize a little more on people. I'm just doing a, a recapitulation. So lastly, equipping your people to respond in alignment with the strategic role, strategic goals becomes very important. I'm taking that in the next session. I'm, I'm sorry, it's a mistake. This is session three. The basic unit of an organization's performance is the job performer. Now, how are we looking at the design of the job, this becomes important. So here I have a concept. Now this rubber and brush, which you see the source that I've taken from, they've taken this model from what I first introduced, the vantage levels by Dr. Gilbert Thomas, where he says, you know, how do we reckon a performer? See, there is an organization level. You, you put in your goals, that's the level at which you look at strategy, you look at your structure, your policies, and also you're clear about your measures at the organization level, how we measure performance. Okay. Then you come down to the process level, the workflow. Many times, workflow itself, we have problems, right? When one department to another department, things move, we do not have proper processes. So I rework on that area. And finally, at the performer level. So you see three levels before it comes to the performer. I'm just taking you through, presently what I have seen in many organizations, when I go through, they are silos. Each department operates like a silo. Right? We have processes, but then the processes are limited within the functions or within the department. But how processes continue seamless from one department to another department or one function to another function, Many lack this, but as a result, we end up with white spaces between one function and another function. Yeah. So, so work actually takes place like this. The customer is not at the bottom of the uh, pyramid, but it's at the sign. The work flows in this way. 
So this is where you find the performer, your processes across functions, across departments. And then you come to the performer. So I'd like to show how you work on the performer. This is actually the human performance system. There are at least six elements that governs it, if you see there. Performer is there. Now, if you check out and do an audit, every performer, how we have worked on him. Now, what is task support, right? Have we given clear input instructions, right? Minimal interference of the, on the job. This I will say, what, what do I mean by minimal interference? Because we have to understand organization as an organic system, as a socio-technical system, you know, and that's the reason put minimal interference. I'll be explaining that in the next module. Right? And is the job logical? And are the resources av available? Tools, are they available? Right? Then performance specification, at what level should the outputs be? Now, when is it a right output? Right now, I I've seen conversations, I've observed the boss telling the subordinate, the, um, you know, hey, Ram, I, I did not expect this from you. Right? Now, the question is, did you ever sit with them to share what were you expecting from them? Right? Have you ever given the specification? So then after that comes in consequences. Consequences are to do with rewards. Now, rewards, mostly our system has rewards at the end of the year. Now, now rewards have a meaning for reinforcement or reinforcing the given productive behavior when it is immediate. Certain things can stand long, certain things have to be immediate. So our consequences that we are giving, is it meaningful, is it timely, is it aligned to whatever is being performed over there? Then comes the feedback. The output that comes from, you know, is there a correction to be done, you know, uh, how is it good? Whatever it is, are you giving that feedback timely? Right. Now, we sit in performance appraisal in the third quarter or the fourth quarter and talk about what went wrong in the first quarter. Right. It, this is not a timely feedback. Right. And whether our feedback is relevant, accurate, accurate means is it data supported? And then is it constructive? Is it to shoot holes or is it to help the person to perform better? And is it easy to understand when you explain? So that the person is able to take it in and then set himself right for better performance. And are we specific when we say, right? And then apart from this, what the organization provides, this is a systemic part of it. But in terms of capacity part, does the performer have the required knowledge and skill? This is on, right at the selection process. We should have looked at it. If we had did, done a bungling at the selection time, now, many organizations have seen, you know, you select a person within six months, and that's the reason that we have uh, probation also. Within six months, we find that the, our selection is not right, and we chuck the person out. So even right at that time, you know, um, does, the, does the person have the capacity, the skill? You, trainability should be seen. But if the person does not have the comprehension, so the attitude is not there, then it becomes a problem. Then the individual capacity is the person able to perform. Now, I have a detailed description of this here. So the I have been filled here. It starts with first performance specification. So you design your system from what is expected output first. So do you do your performance, you know, standards exist? Do performers know what is the desired output? Uh, do performers consider the standards attainable, which means you get into agreement that you will be able to do it. Yeah. After that, you look into what is the task support you're giving the person in order to help the person perform this. That can the task be done without interference from other tasks? Are the job procedures and workflow logical? Are there adequate resources available, like the tools? Time for doing a job, enough staff to do, enough information, and then the consequence, which I've already explained. 
Okay. So this up till now is a holistic understanding of performance management. So right from, you know, looking at your ecosystem, staying relevant to that and, you know, keeping your business compatible and competitive from there on, you're coming into whether your structure is right, then your process is right, then your people who fit into that with the necessary capacity. So if you have a system like this, when change happens, the wiring is very clear, right? The outside relationship to the inside the final component of performance, you know, is the individual. And when the wiring is clear, you make a quick change responding to what is outside and you have a channel coming and connecting it to the performer who quickly changes and readapts and then starts working. Now, if this wiring and if this system is not done, you know, in the coming days, for us to respond to change quickly will become a challenge. Right. So we need to see this entire wiring, how the strategy is mapped until the last person who is the performer. Okay. See, what's been happening is that if you take the management side, over the years, our understanding of organizations have been truncated. At a particular time, given point in time, what is important, that we have seen. Starting from Frederick Taylor, scientific management, he started applying engineering principles to organizations management. Right. And then you had McLellan. He completely looked at a different angle. He saw the people side and he looked into the motivation part of it. And uh, further taking the motivation, Abraham Maslow spoke about hierarchy of needs and hierarchy in the levels of motivation. Then came in, you know, understanding organizations as an open system. So Kurt Lewin, you know, he brought in and we started looking at organizations as an open system and we started looking at bringing in system thinking. Uh, persons who propagated this is Peter Senge uh, you know, in learning organization talks about system thinking and the humans as a subsystem. So each took, you know, portions. And then we had the competition coming in the competitive advantage, Michael Porter talking about it. Uh, and then in the, with the IT revolution, business process re-engineering came and downsizing became a major thing. Right? And uh, each decade built upon theories and researches and learning from the previous decade. Now, presently, a lot of emphasis is laid on leadership. Now with all this, if the leadership is not equipped, now the whole thing, falls apart. So there is a lot of onus on the leadership. But and, and none of these things gives us a holistic perspective of an organization to work on. Okay, now we are getting close to 11.45. What I thought is before we go to module two, we can take a five minute break. You want to yeah, you know, the bio. So we can, I'll just set my timer in and uh, five minutes from now, we can take a break. And exactly five minutes from now, we will start again. Is that okay? Okay, we can, now it's 11.40, we can get back at 11.45. Yeah. Back, we are into the second module. Now, please note down your questions as we are progressing. Second module is uh, looking at organization as an organic entity. You know, uh, it, see, somehow we miss seeing that because of the technology that comes in. Uh, we make it into a straight jacket. And I'm going to give you some examples to revisit our thought on how we look at organization as an organic entity. Yeah. And uh, as I told you already, I'm going to take you in session one and session two. In the first session, giving you an exam, uh, this construct, which I call as future proof, 
which will be the concept and then how we apply that concept to make our organization a rapid organic organization that responds to the changes which are happening outside. Uh, um, understanding organization as an organic adaptive system. Now, what are the characteristics of an organic organization? Now, what are the characteristics of an organic organization? We have a lot of publications on that. Now, Burns and Stalker noted in the management of innovation that organic structures are appropriate in unstable, turbulent, unpredictable environments. Now, the, most of us spoke about you know, uncertainty. Now, if we look back, you know, how many of us can say that my organization is an organic organization? I'll also tell you how an organic organization responds because most of us are mechanistic or to a limited extent we have brought in organic. Right? Now, what are the aspects of being an organic organization? You know, the responsibilities are decentralized. We'll see that a little more, right? Decisions also are decentralized. Um, uh, one of you said about waiting for decision. You know, if it is going to be a decision which need not necessarily wait for that person, you know, at a performance vantage level, can those be converted into policies so that people down the line can take it up and do it? So decentralization, many times uh, leaders hold on to things without their knowledge because they would have grown along with the organization or uh, they would have been excellent in one aspect of capabilities and therefore they kept growing up but then they have not been mentored or they have not been coached into the other aspects of how do you decentralize, right? Organic organizations are highly decentralized. And next is they are flexible. They are, uh, the jobs are broadly defined, not very narrowly and with strict boundaries, but they are flexible. Then interdependence among employees and units. This is another important thing. Multi-directional communication. Sometimes small organizations get stuck in this multi-directional communication. Employee initiatives. Relatively few and broadly defined rules, regulations, procedures, and processes. We'll see why it is required. Then employee participation in problem solving and decision making. Okay, now I'm just giving this as a concept again. Uh, I will close it also with this concept. Uh, I don't see much talk being talked about socio technical systems. Of course, in some areas, the IT companies have adopted this, but uh, not all organizations are operating or designed as a socio-technical system. Now, uh, what do I mean by socio-technical system? You see, organizations manufacture things and do things, create their output through one major aspect, which is technology or machines. Now, operating this are be people, human beings. Right? Now, human beings are social animals. Now, they have their own norms of behavior. Now, what we do is we try to constrict this into the mechanistic processes and systems. So as a result, we lose out on a lot of capabilities that are contained in the people as a natural process. Right? Now, research is way down soon after the World War, largely by Tavistock Institute of Human Relations, where I also got trained over there. And they have done a lot of experiment to prove successful organization, uh, you know, need to, uh, uh, I mean, an organization succeed very successfully and their systems are social technical. Let me tell you there are at least five principles of it. So systems, the understanding, the basic assumptions on which you build the organization. Systems should have interdependent parts. So, you know, when I read this, it looks so dry and unable to understand. The next slide, I'll make it for you too, easy to understand. Systems should adapt to and pursue goals in external environment. That is, they have to respond to what is happening outside the organization. Systems have an internal environment comprising separate but interdependent 
technical and social subsystems. Systems have equifinality. In other words, system goals can be achieved by more than one means. And that's the reason autonomy is required in systems, right? Because there's not only one way of doing things. People can do things in different ways and sometimes even more efficiently. So this implies that there are design choices to be made during system development. And then finally, system performance relies on the joint optimization of technical and social subsystems. Focusing on one of these systems to the exclusion of the other is likely to lead to degrading system performance and utility. Now look at this, when I just change this system, what happens? There's a paradigm shift on this. Team accomplishment, I've just replaced the word system with team. Team accomplishments have interdependent processes. Teams should adapt to and pursue goals in external environment. Right, so internally, the processes, you know, when you are working, it, it is responding to the external, what is happening into the outside world, which comes in through your strategic plans. Teams have an internal environment comprising separate but interdependent technical and relational components. So there are techno-relational components in this. So uh, we find a lot of that during these days when remote working has come and such high dependency on technology. You know, all of a sudden Wi-Fi has become so important, your computers have become so important and, and your uh, Zooms and the WebEx and these things have become very important. So the, the, there's a techno-relational process that's added on to it. And this again, teams have equifinality. In other words, team goals can be achieved by more than one means, which means, are your teams autonomous? Do you have self-managed working teams? Because it's an imperative if it is a socio-technical system. This implies that there are design choices to be made during the normative stage of the team. Right? Are you giving enough autonomy for the organization, to, for the teams to function? So team performance relies on the joint optimization of the technical and relational components. Focusing on one to the exclusion of the other is likely to lead to suboptimal team performance and utilization. Okay, now uh, keep this in mind. Now, what we are going to look at is, if you are going to make your organization ready for facing uncertainty, one of the important things is that you have to look at whether your organization is organic and adaptive. And one of the essentials of being organic is autonomy also. So we're going to look into those aspects of how do you build autonomy into organizations. Right. So for rapid organization response to changing paradigms, you now future proofing is important. The concept of surviving and thriving comes under this first concept, what I call as future proof. I'll tell you what the acronym means. And uh, the application of what you find in the concept, the first concept, I'm bringing it in the second bit. I'm calling it as war performance which is also an acronym. Okay, now, uh, Joel Bakker, he was called, he's called as the futurist in, uh, in, in management terms. Uh, now, when you look at the 20th century competitive advantage, Michael Porter brought the competitive advantage when you have had all the Japanese coming in and you have to compete. That what he said is there are four things for your competitive advantage: you know, your quality, your quantity, your cost, and your time. Now, what Joel Barker said towards the 90s is in the new century, in the 21st century. Now, all that Michael Porter said are going to become entry qualifications for products there'll be entry qualification for products, right? Now, then what do you do? What is going to be a competitive advantage then? He said, anticipation. You know, can you anticipate? Can you anticipate what's going to happen? Mute, please. Yeah, your anticipation. And once you anticipate, you pick that up and you start innovating. 
Gentlemen, can you? Okay. Now, if you take this anticipation, if we really scan the public information, there have been enough to anticipate on the pandemic. Okay, I'd like to share with you certain things. You'll be surprised. A person by name Richard Rothschild, he patented something called COVID-19 test kit. He patented it in with the Dutch government in 2015, which means this gentleman, to whichever company or business he belonged to, there was an anticipation. Right, and, and also the time accuracy that he looked at. Right, so he patented test kits for COVID tests, you know, in 2015. Right. And there's another organization by name, World International Trade Solutions. They sold millions of these test kits as early as 2017 and 2018. Okay. And then I'll tell you another surprising thing. Um, there's an act in the uh, US called Coronavirus Aid Relief Economic uh, Services. Yes, Cor Coronavirus Aid Relief Economic uh, Services. That is the government was helping out organizations which suffered because of the COVID hit. Right. Now, the, the, the first check that he signed was somewhere in September the, this year. Now, if you go into the net and see when this act was passed, this act was passed in 2019, January 24th. So what I'm trying to say is there are a lot of telltale signals. If you really keep your ears close to the ground, there are enough. And how do we do that? I'm going to also share with you. Right. So there's enough to anticipate. Uh, so who is going to do that? Anticipation, is it a function in your organization? Whose responsibility will be anticipation? Whose responsibility will be innovation? Right. We'll be looking into that. So uh, it, uh, the acronym FUTURE, F stands for 4C. So here I'm saying that 4C is anticipation. If you want to manage uncertainty, you have to pick capabilities of 4C. And I'll also tell you who will do that and how we will go about doing it. Okay? So the question is, by, does my organization have a system of scanning the business landscape, the macro social system, and foreseeing phenomena? You know, when you relate phenomena to phenomena, you'll be able to also anticipate and see what could this lead to, right? Okay, now, uh, I didn't say at the beginning, uh, as a part of the plan of this webinar, we said we'll give a small bio break in between. So now it's exactly half time, 3.15. You can quickly take a five minute break. You want to grab a cup of coffee or take a quick wash, you know, visit the washroom. You can finish that. And again, exactly five minutes from now, uh, and I'll open the screen again for you. Okay. So you can take a quick five minute break. Okay. Ready? Are we good to go? Yep. Thank you. Okay. Now we just saw about anticipation. F stands for the future anticipation. So how do we do foreseeing aspect of it? <clears throat> the next is understand the context or the phenomena. See, it's easy to see something. Uh, I also say that uh, uh, we notice much less than what we see. Right. So it's possible for seeing, but then are we able to understand, interpret it, and bring it to what it matters to us inside, right? Uh, he, he, uh, one of my friends was working at a senior level with Shell. So what he was saying is, Within two hours of the 9-11 crash, right, the team got together. They had a system for that. The team got together to quickly come out, you know, what is going to be the impact of this hit? 
you know, the, the Twin Tower fall, what is going to be the impact of it? In two hours, as soon as it happened, in two hours they got together, they had a rough plan of what it is going to be. So how do we understand what is happening outside? So once you foresee and gather information, you have to interpret its impact on your business and understand how it's going to impact. Look at the business canvas model. You know, what are the touch points that will be affected? In what way should you rework? There's an interesting study. If you have read this book called Blown to Bits, you know, the first revolution of IT, you know, how some organization came up, how some organization went down. There's an interesting case, the author presents there. You know, Britannica Encyclopedia, which made a revenue of $750 million in 1991, was sold in 1996 to a financer, an investment person by name Jacob Safra, you know, at half the book value. It was almost like $135 million or so. I'll tell you how this resulted. And now, the research indicated uh, this 32 volume, 129 pound book, right? When people bought it, they bought it just to make a statement of their status, okay? And uh, when they saw about the readability of it, they found that it was 0.5 per year. What does it mean? Two families buying this, one family opened it once in a year. So which means the utility value of it was not there. People just bought to make a statement of their status as such. So that was very clearly written. And at that point in time, something else was happening. That is, Encarta was selling a brief encyclopedia, not as big as Britannica, but an encyclopedia in a CD-ROM. Right? So that was another reality. And uh, when the marketing people, the chief executives saw all this, somebody came and told, hey, our sales is dropping slightly. Would you think that Encarta could be a competitor? They simply scoffed at it. They said, see, our product is $2,250. And Encarta CD-ROM is $70. How on earth can you imagine a $70 product competing with a $2,000 plus dollar product? And they just ignored it, right? The evidence was there. It was not just Encarta, there's something more. But then did they factor that? Did they interpret that was a question. And uh, then what happened is, okay, it's, it's just a CD-ROM uh, ch choice. Okay, we'll bring a CD-ROM. And what they did is they brought a CD-ROM selling it at $1,000, right? And then the writing on the wall was very clear. Step by step, things went bad. And by 1996, it had to be sold out. Now, I tell you what is a fact. Now, what they misread was they only misread a byproduct of something else. The competition to them was not from the CD-ROM. The competition to them was the new uh, desktop computers. The desktop computer, which was sold at $1,500 at that time, was the real competitor. It was not the CD-ROM. Because you can have a CD-ROM, but if you don't have a computer, you cannot use it. So what they missed was that, look, this CD-ROM, and uh, look, this $1,500 computer, tabletop, desktop is coming, and we have to be careful. We have to do something about it. But they missed that. Okay. So understanding the phenomena is something very important. Do we have, these are new capabilities that we have to build into our organization, uh, interpret it and, and have, I mean, there are a lot of things to, today to help us. Design thinking, you know, design thinking is not just for a product design, but we can, I apply design thinking for my interventions. Now you can apply design thinking for interpreting the data that is outside and how can we respond to this, okay? Right, now you for understanding. T is to tune in. Once you understand, how do you tune in to re-engineer wherever needed? I'm not talking a system-wise re-engineering. Sometimes it may be required, but sometimes just a portion of it. So systems should adapt to and pursue goals in external environment. We saw that this is a statement from socio-technical process, right? So what internal systems and processes should change in response? The, I'm giving you this example. Jacob Safra quickly responded going online, you know? He said, as soon as he purchased this, he said, hey guys, you know, your time is out for selling the 32 volume, 129 pound books, 
right? It's over. So what he did is quickly shut the sales department, home sales department. He dismantled the printing press, right? And he started going online. So the response to what is happening outside could mean also to re-engineer the inside, right? Not always, but sometimes re-engineer portions of it, sometimes re-engineer the entire thing, right? But we have to become clear about what is the link to the processes, link to the structures also, new structures also could be formed in. Um, I know of a, a construction company, a promoter company, uh, an engineering company. Yeah, you know, the boss of the engineering company kept on telling, hey guys, you know, low cost housing is going to become the trend and, um, you know, you have to start working on it. But what he did not do is, he did not set up a separate research department. He did not create a separate process inside the organization to ensure that we are doing something about what is happening in the environment. As a result, the company ended up in a terrible loss, right? So responding outside, interpreting it, responding to what is outside, interpreting it, and doing the necessary responsiveness inside the organization, which is whether you have to re-engineer. So that is another important aspect, okay? Now, this one is embrace. You know, this is adoption by the people. You can do all these things, but how the people are responding. One good thing that has been happening these days, companies transitioning to remote workforces have accelerated digital information transfer faster than ever before. Uh, that's because also the other aspect, it was life and death for people. The companies were closed for a long time. If you don't do this, there's no other way. You know, about 122 million people lost their job. So it could also have been the threat which made them to adopt quickly. But inside the organization, do we have a quick adopting system? So it has to be rapid organic response of internalizing. So this is the people part of it. Now, how are you working on your people you know, for them to quickly take over and start uh, internalizing? So the redesigning of the job for the job performer. Now, we need to have an understanding in all these areas if we have to deal with uncertainty, if we have to deal with future turbulence. It's not just getting to what's happening outside. It's not just getting to interpret what's happening outside. It's not just redesigning how you have to respond. It's also how you're working on your people for this. Right. So that is the E part of it. Then the R. The, now, when you do all these things, you are able to respond and not react, right? So this phase uh, is, this phase is getting into action after your internal process have built responses to the external, after understanding and embracing it. So when you're prepared, you are responding. Your steps are sure. But when you're not prepared, you are reacting. Even in a human system, you know, reactionary times, when you, when you get into reaction, you know, your physiological process is more blood goes into that reacting part, which is emotional, than the cognitive part. So organizations have to learn how to respond rather than to react. So react impairs collective thinking. So system thinking gives place to random thinking and reaction. So you, after you've done all this, your plan, you apply it, you check, you evaluate the trajectory it is taking also, because that also has to happen. Now, well, I've done all this, but am I still connected to what is happening outside? Will I be successful? Right? Am I really uh, surviving? Right? Am I really thriving? Yeah. You have to also keep looking at it. Not once you have received everything, you changed everything, you re-engineered, you trained your people. No. You're look out has to be constant. I'm going to take you through that in the next one. Now, again, coming back to Britannica example, when Britannica saw people going for CD-ROM, they simply reacted and prepared CD-ROM selling at $1,000, which is reaction. They did not think about it. They did not look at MCATA selling at $70. They thought people had a fancy for CD-ROMs, which is not. So they realized after some years, then brought down the cost of it to $85. And still more, actually, in reality, what happened is um, with MS Office, uh, Microsoft started giving NCATA CDs free of cost. That also worsened the condition of 
Britannica earlier. Okay, now we will go to the next module. I suppose now the conceptually you are clear. So the next one is, so what we saw is 4C understand, tune in, embrace and respond. So the first one is mostly the work of the CEO, the top management, right? Then you understand to interpret it. Then the re-engineering people, the internal people take over. Then the performer takes over and then you signal the action. Okay, now this is what I call as WAR performance, W-A-R, and performance is performance coaching, so I cut it short for performance. So how an adaptive organic response takes place. Right now we saw systemically how you can be very sound, but an organization is a socio-technical system. Now can you create organic response in the organization? So how do we go about doing it? So the best example is, you know, if you take the human system or you take any animal system, we are very quick to adapt. You know, um, take one of us and put, it, put us in a cold place, we will adapt to it. Put us in a hot place, we'll adapt to it. You know, you, you put us in a five-star hotel, we'll adapt to it. You put us in, um, uh, you know, in a one-room uh, kitchen, we adapt. So human beings have an enormous capacity for adapting. Animals also do have, right? So there's a lot that we can learn from organic systems. How do we build our organizations? So W, I say, is for Watchtower CEO. Now CEOs have to be on the lookout now eh? as to what I'm going to say. Watchtower CEO. Then A is autonomous work teams. We saw in the socio-technical system, there are more than one correct answer. So when you give the autonomy, people will be able to find that out. And I'll also tell you what all autonomy brings in. So, a stands for autonomous work team. So this is the application level of module that I'm sharing with you. The first was conceptual. Here is actually you get into ACT. What you do in your ACT is what I'm going to take you through. So Watchtower CEO uh, is for autonomous work teams. Then R is for relational capital index. Right Now, this is something that we ignore, but uh, we think of it. That is... Organizations are social systems, right? Uh, if you take industrial organization, they're socio-technical, but just pure organization is a social system. Now, relationship is primary. Culturally, if the relational capital goes up, you know, the, the culture becomes very rich, uh, taking responsibilities. I'll, I'll deal with it when we come over there. There's something more also I have to share with you on that. And then comes in performance coaching. Now, at an application level, when you do these things, you will see a phenomenal organization that develops. So this model primarily embraces an organic organization's approach. So let's see the details. A case for organic model. And this is a case study that I have also included in your handout that has been given. If any of you had a time to read, it's very interesting. Uh, some of you would have read it. See, early 19th, uh, 20th century, somewhere, I think, 1902 or three, this happened. There are two expedition groups which are competing with each other. One is from Norway, the other one is from Britain. So Norwegian explorer, Roald Amundsen, you know, he wanted to reach uh, the South Pole to be the first. And then Robert Scott, who was a very decorated British naval officer, he also won. So both were competing. And they see what's the best model. Now, when you study the case, you know, Roald was able to succeed. In two months, he finished. He took the team, went, he, he stuck the flag there, he returned. Two months, everything was over. Robert Scott, you know, to, even to reach there, he took over two months. And then while coming, about 150 miles before reaching his return destination point, the man died. Before that, everybody else in his team died. The simple thing, if you analyze, 
you would see Rold chose an organic system, an adaptive system. So what he did is he went and studied the Eskimos. So he found that they used sledge dogs, right? And, uh, and, uh, and they used sledges to carry things. So he factored these two. So he got a lot of sledge dogs and he bought a lot of sledges. That's number one. Number two, all his team members, he chose them to be as skiers, right? People who are already used to snow. And what happened uh, while traveling, there were all, a lot of other operational things also they took into account. They offloaded, you know, they built small sheds, they offloaded food and other stuff which they are going to use while returning. And so they reduced their weight. Everything was a very organic thought process. And the dogs that they took became their meat to eat. So, uh, you know, as the weight decreased, they did not, it, it looks a little cruel, but then it, it was also a practical solution. And dogs easily adapted to that cold, you know, these sledge dogs. But whereas Robert, if you take, what he did was he took motorized, uh, mechanized systems, right? And he took ponies, which are not really used for the cold, right? And what happened is about two weeks into the journey, his uh, uh, mechanical systems started failing, ponies started dying. Finally, human beings started drawing, pulling the ledge. You know, 150, 200 pounds of weight they had to do. One by one, they started getting, uh, you know, blisters in their legs and, you know, gangrene and all that. One by one, died. So you see here, uh, the goal is same, but one took an organic model, the other took a me mechanistic model, and you see what succeeded. There's a lot to learn from this. Right? So here, what we are recommending is an organic model. Watch our CEO. What I'm saying is, if you are a CEO, you have to de-operationalize yourself, rewrite your JD. Uh, as I told you, the other CEO who, whom I met, the Spice organization, he was telling me that, Half day, every day, he was spending time in the factory. Then why do we have a factory manager? Right? Is that your job? Right? Many times, CEOs get sucked inside the organization. Now, we have to rewrite the JD. Now, who is this Watchtower CEO? So major gateways of information in an organic system is in the head, if you see. Major gateways. Information from outside world gets into your body through your head, which means one is your eye, the other one is your ear, right? And smell also, it goes through your nose. So the head is equipped for receiving none of the other parts of the body. Of course, there are sensitization when you touch something, but in terms of other information of smell, visual and hearing are all situated on the head. So the function of a head in an organic system is watch out and send information inside. So the responsibility of the CEO is not to be worried about how the heart is pumping or how the muscles are at work, how the digestive system is in operation. No, they are all autonomous systems. Okay, they have their boundaries. When it is required, they come to the uh, brain, but otherwise they are autonomous system. Now, do we have organizations operating like that? So that's what we mean by social technical systems, right? So having autonomy. Now, if you give autonomy, you, your time gets free. If your processes are uh, paka, then you, you, get, you, you get time for other things. But it's also a question of character. Can you let go? So the head most of the time is taking information from outside and connects internal response to the outside. Okay, so it takes information from the outside and it connects the internal response to the outside a very good system to learn what we can do for the organizations. So much of the internal activities are autonomous from the head. They are not continuously talking to the head about what they are doing, but they all have a given boundary within which they work. Beyond that, they have to disturb the, uh, the brain. Right. So in organizations also, autonomous groups have their own boundaries, but within the boundaries, they operate. And just take a look at this. There's something that has frightened this little cat. It's continuously taking information from outside. The head is busy. The body is doing its function. 
but the head is between the eyes and the ears, if you see. Now, this is what our CEOs need to be doing. They have to set a system for this aspect. So this is what I call the watchtower CEO. You're up in, in the quarter deck. Right? Steps to deoperationalize what we can do. I'm just giving you some ideas. You will be experts in doing more. Make CXO team as a self directed team with minimal interference from the CEO. Set purpose, norms, and clear boundaries. Empower the team. I've seen this work. One, uh, one of my clients, I mean, it's, it's a over a billion dollar company. For my clients. This Look, uh, meet up with y'all, right? Once in a week, right? Just once in a week. Otherwise, I'm not going to be in the office. Right? Once in a week. And he had a schedule of time. So for some people, he gave the 20 minutes time or a one hour time once in a week, once in two weeks. So otherwise, he completely made his CXO team autonomous. And they had power to take a decision up to a certain limit, even financially. The team was empowered. And thereby, you know, they were able to take on good amount of turbulence and the organization keeps on growing, expanding businesses. So this has been a very rich model. So what I'm saying is not off the hat, but I've seen it operating. And this gentleman used to be a part of the CII team and he used to uh, you know, mix up with so many people. So I, you'll see what I'm saying next. The CEO should engage in diverse meetings in the marketplace, scanning the business landscape, the phenomena influencing the macro social system. So you're busy, you know, attending meetings and you know, you're continuously worried about, you know, how I keep, keep my organization's head up in the waters. So you have to create your own job description for this. But really speaking, most of us CEOs, even CXOs, do not have time for these bodies, uh, like uh, um, you know the CIA meetings and all that. If we have time, we give time to it. But then there's a lot to come from that, a lot to come from reading, a lot to come from a lot of conferences. So this is a skill to be developed because we notice much less than we see, right? We notice much less. <clears throat> that is, what we interpret from what we see is much less. So, for which we need the help of others. So, these conferences uh, and these professional bodies are real potent uh, places for us. If required, initiate surveys also. I mean, as a CEO, you can write articles, initiate surveys conferences on subjects of anticipated change. Now, CXO teams should be trained to understand and interpret the data coming in to decode and to encode it from team and to encode it for teams down the line. That is, the, the CXO teams, once the CEO gathers all this information and comes and sits with his cross-functional CXO teams and says that, look, how is it going to affect our organization? Right? And how do we interpret this? Is this something that we have to do in anticipation? Now, these are skills that we have to develop. Okay, so, so th that's over for the uh, CEO, how the CEO de-operationalizes. I've just given hints but there could be a lot more that you can think about and do. Now, autonomous self-managed work teams. In the body system, when information is passed on to the body from the head, the internal system take charge autonomously. I'll give you an example. For example, if there is a danger signaled for flight, some danger, the head sees, the eye sees it and tells the body, immediately the legs take over and starts running. 
right? It does not wait for the dictate from the head, but it just receives the information and starts right. So there is a sense of autonomy, right? So the same way our work teams can, is there autonomy in our work teams? One of the significance of self-managed work teams, which operate as autonomous teams are ownership and interdependence. I've seen, I've worked and created a lot of teams. You now, when uh, Atel Landline came into Chennai, the, the customer relations team was made into a self-managed work team. And the productivity went up so high that the CEO called me and said, can you make the entire organization to be a self-managed work team? Okay, it's easy said, but then there's a lot of, uh, you know, commitment that the top man has to make in order to do that. But then that was the significance over there. And I've seen the, my own teams, which I have uh, worked with, created this autonomy. And you can see the energy that comes out of it. Right? Because we are created like that. Now, it's just an architecture of a self-managed work team, which I prepared earlier for uh, in the context of a manufacturing organization, but then uh, architecture can differ from organization to organization. This is just a pictorial idea that I'm giving. So at the bottom, you have high performance work teams. These are self-managed. So just about that at a tactical level, you have teams, uh, they're also autonomous and they work as a support to the one down. And then you have the high performance strategic team, uh, which will be at the CXO levels or the HOD levels, which are self-directed. They are actually a cross-functional team. Okay. Now, uh, I'm bringing back what I had shared with you earlier. Team accomplishments have interdependent processes that when you create an autonomous work teams, all these things are easily set up as norms. Teams should adapt to and pursue goals in external environment. Teams have an internal environment comprising separate but interdependent technical and relational components. And teams have equifinality. This is where I say, there's not uh, you, you know, one size fits for all. So there are many ways in which solutions can be brought about. When autonomy is there, you start working. There's an interesting case sometime ago which happened in Sundaram Fasteners. You know, there was a, there's a kiln uh, brick which conked off. And as a result, the kiln could not be operated. So what happened is uh, the, uh, the person who was responsible for that, he was a junior level guy. And, uh, but he took autonomy into his hands. And to order that uh, those brick kilns, would take a week. It had to come from Calcutta. Uh, and those days, uh, it was not like the courier service of today. And uh, even, um, you know, travel, even senior executives and all to get a flight travel was a rare thing. So what this boy did was, he said, if I'm to wait, I lose seven days of production. And the boss was off somewhere else. And those were the days before your mobile phones and he could not be contacted. So this man, he took an autonomous decision. He booked a flight and, and, and the cost of that stones, those bricks, those days was just 700 rupees, right? But the loss was amounting to lakhs of rupees. So he took a flight, went there, he bought, he came back. You know, in, a, in, in two days time, he was able to replace and start the production. So for which he did receive a good commendation from the CEO when he returned. So this is what you can expect from autonomous work groups, but you can also set boundaries with, with which they operate. Okay. And uh, there's an interesting case that uh, I have to share where uh, I was a part of developing uh, as an internal consultant, uh, uh, autonomous work groups, self-managed work teams. This was in two products of India. Now, there was a constant complaint that you know, some tubes, those are the, they were those seamless tubes, which was used for the automobile industry. That they had a small bend. Nobody could find out. Nobody could find out. Years went by, nobody could find out. And then when this 
autonomous work group started functioning, you know, one group which was associated with those production, they decided, you know, we are going to crack this. So what they did, they closely followed all the movement or the directions this tube goes about right from the time it is finished manufacturing. So when they found it after manufacturing, you know, it was good. But when it was about to be dispatched, they found some tubes had a bend in the middle, very fine bend, but it, it, had, it will be rejected when it goes to the customers. So what they did was they tracked it, night and day did track. You know, if it is not an autonomous team, they will not work like that. So they took so much of pride in wanting to crack it. So they found that at one point in time, after one given process, in one given shift, you know, the tubes were bent. So they said, we are going to investigate this. So they found that that shift was a night shift. So they followed the tube. When the tube arrived for oil dipping, they were all paka, very neat. And then after the oil dipping was over, because all this had been taken a huge oil tank, anti corrosive oil, and it was dipped and it's placed. So only in the night shift, after it was being dipped in the anti corrosive oil, the tubes had a bend. And then they noticed, how did this bend come? Nobody was beating it about. Then they found that the crane operator who took this and dipped it into the oil and lifted it up, when he turned the crane, there were floodlights hitting his face. So it was too difficult for him to just keep staring. So he dipped and quickly took it out. So when he took out, he gave a small jerk because he had to take it fast and turn it around and keep. That jerk created the bend. And all that they had to do was shift the floodlights and the problem was solved. So this is the power of autonomous work groups. So the, the socio-technical -technic approach that we do. So W-A-R, so Watchtower Executive. And internally, we have autonomous work group. Right from the CXO team level down the line. Now, if we could build a self-managing work team architecture, right? Response will be fast and taking responsibility will be much more than what the promoters think that, that they can achieve. Okay. Council in the US called International Integrated Reporting Council. Now this council consults organizations on uh, governance and transparency in reporting. Right? They help you on your annual reports. And if this is what you have to report in the annual report, what you can do for the organization side also, they help you. On which they have certain areas on which you have to report and how you have to measure. So one area is on capitals. So they have about six or seven capitals. I'm not sharing everything. So financial capital is there. Um, human capital is there. And social capital is there. And then an important thing is relational capital. Right now, all these things have indexes, relational capital. And some time ago when I was visiting their website, I found that for measuring and working on relational capital, this particular thing which I'm going to share with you uh, is from a company called Rel Relational Analytics. They recommended use this. And they said that uh, even researchers indicated when people used this particular approach to relationship, the culture of the organization went up, right? The productivity went up. Uh, so there's a positive culture that is built in. Autonomous work group creates a, one culture, relational, uh, uh, this concept of relational index, you know, or, or relational capital creates another. So here, there's a richness that we want to bring about for creating a high level of a fluidity of absorbing changes and responding quickly. Now, it has five drivers. Very simple to understand. What it talks about is, in teams, do you find connectedness among people? Is there a directness in relationship, right? Within team and team to team. And there is a way of working on it also. Then they talk about, is there a legacy in relationship? Is there a storyline? Uh, I mean, if you are connected over a period in time, the richness in your relationship becomes very different. 
So do we have legacies and relationships? Next is depth, right? If, if, if I know one of you, there's one way of just knowing you, uh, that you are a vice president so-and-so, and you're very good at work, right? You're, um, you're a highly uh, celebrated professional in this field. That's one part. The other part is, do, do I know you as a person? Your likes and dislikes, your family life, right? And uh, your part-time, your hobby, right? Your interests, uh, the experiences that you've gone through in life. Right? When I know that, my affinity and attachment to you is much higher and the social capital that we will build together would be very different. So it talks about, do we have depth in relationship? Do we build depths in relationships? And the next is respect. You may be a boss, but I, as your team member, do I feel respected by you? Right. And team members to team members, do you know? Do we feel that equity is prevailing in our team? And then, when we are working as a team, do we find a shared purpose? You know, what this creates, you know, the, the power of presence is created when we are, are connected. Then a storyline, breadth in the relationship. Storyline gives you the length in relationship. Depth gives you the breadth in relationship. It's thick. Respect says, I treat everybody fair. And shared purpose talks about being aligned. Um, now, just a quick look at, you know, the behavior and the... Up here. Ah, correct. So behavior and outcome of relational drivers. We saw five drivers. See, behavior is uh, the contact that we start the presence. Now, what it results in is connection. So the team feels connected. So in the first driver, what we are creating is the connectedness, the connection. Right. When when Actually, I presided over a team of 12 people, worked them as autonomous and developed this relational culture in them. You know what people used to say? When we walk into the bay where your team sits, we can sense the energy that comes in. And really speaking, when people felt low, they used to come into this space, talk a little to them and go. So that is the power of teams. You know? So here when the team feels connected, the next is, you know, when there's a legacy in relationship, you know, people have spent time together. There's a storyline. There's a momentum the relationship picks. The result of it is a sense of belonging. <clears throat> the sense of belonging is something very innately earned for in every human being. Many political things also happen just because the, um, uh, the deficit that people have in the sense of belongingness. People become political in organization. So belongingness is another that happens. Now, all these become cultural com components in the organization. Then you have the breadth of knowledge. When you know more about each other, I know about you, you know about me. What is developed is mutual appreciation, right? Uh, we honor each other. There's a lot of respect that we have for each other, the mutual appreciation that helps it. Then sharing power, if it's a boss, Delegation, sharing power, you know, which brings in participation and brings in the experience of respect. Then purpose, when the teams, autonomous teams, always I recommend when we work on autonomous team, they have to have a collective purpose, have to have collective purpose. So when you have a collective purpose, you are aligned. And when you're aligned, there's synergy, and there's a unity. So W-A-R, so you have the watchtower executive, who, uh, chief executive, you know, who collects that information, what, how we need to respond, everything there, and it is sent inside. You have an adaptive, organically responding, autonomous work systems inside the organization, which ingests, digests, and starts working. And to build this, with a rapid response, 
relationships. Relationships are like nervous system. They connect people to people and there is no political interference you know, for things to be waiting. They just start happening. Like as I told you in the stew products, you know, nobody told anything to these workmen. At workmen level, autonomous work group, they took it on them. And they saved lakhs and lakhs of rupees for the organization. And if at all, it could have been only them who could have resolved it. And uh, then comes the relationship. See, autonomy and then the relationship. You see how rich a culture can be developed on this. Many times we think we are relating. I was dealing with a large family-run organization. And uh, the, the next generation of uh, people, uh, family members were taken, taking over. You know, these were young people, just about 26, 28, but they're taking over as managing directors who had functional heads, uh, age of 50, uh, you know, reporting to them as vice presidents and directors and all that. And they wanted to know how they're doing. So on the relational terms. And uh, when I did a test on this, they thought there are two different perspectives. These HODs and the CXO teams, what they thought about th this member of the family, where he or she stands with respect to relationship and what they thought they were in terms of relationship. And they found there was a wide difference. And when this was brought to surface, and, uh, you know, uh, they started discussing and taking decisions. How do we enrich this? And there was a phenomenal change, a real uh, paradigm change that happened the way that they, they started relating after that. So relational capital index, you know, you have to start working it within teams first. Now, every team has to be rich in relationship. And then what we call a stakeholder relationship. One team is a stakeholder to the other team. So how the stakeholder relationship takes place also becomes another important. Okay, now the last one, the performance. Actually, I cut short the word coaching. What performance, what performance coaching. Now, I'll quickly share. I just have five minutes. 20 minutes is for your questioning time. But we started off so about seven minutes late. So give me a couple of minutes extra if I'm late. See, uh, we have very less organizations where the leaders take it their responsibility to coach the next generation. Now, you would have heard about this gentleman called Harold Janine. He was AT&T chairman, um, sorry, CEO for nearly 20 years. And it, he was a very tough guy. It used to be said that Harold Janine was a university, a management university. Everybody who worked under him became a CEO because the way he coached them. Sometimes it was unpalatable, but definitely those guys became big time. So this is recommended. Uh, if you get a chance, some of you would have read it. Uh, John Whitmore, Performance Coaching. I would say it is number one coaching book. Right. Now in this coaching, you need not necessarily go through a certification and all that. Right? You can get trained uh, in, inside the organization yeah, going through basics of understanding what is coaching, basically it all comes from your heart. Uh, I'll tell you, there's a very interesting uh, story that was, uh, it's not a story, it is a real event that was written by a person when he wrote the book called Living Organizations. Uh, his name is Eri D. Goss. Eri D. Goss. I've ad added this little event to your reading material. Now, what this person was observing uh, in England before the World War, uh, you know, there was something that was happening. That is, you have this, today we have uh, milk sachets. Those days, even when I was young, we used to have bottle, milk bottles. And I think some states still continue with that. So these milk bottles used to be supplied to houses and it used to be kept on porches, porches of houses. And when this uh, travels in a truck, because of the shake, the cream comes up. Now, what happened is these red robin birds and the English titmouse birds, both of these birds discovered that this was a good food. And if they had a, a good serve early in the morning, it was done for the day and it tasted good. So these open bottles, 
the cream on the top, they came, ate, and then they enjoyed it. After the World War, what happened is uh, this aluminium foils came in and then they uh, started covering the bottles with this aluminium foil. Now what happened is, uh, uh, again, this Red Robin found out how to you know, pick and slightly tear and then have a help of the cream. Same way, the English titmouse bird also found it. Now what happened is, observers saw that after some times, the population of red robins disappeared. Uh, but the English titmouse, they prospered. Behavior-wise, what they found was this red robin, the generations became so used to the screen, and once they did not know how to eat it or uh, you know help themselves, uh, they did not know how else to have food, and they slowly started perishing. It's within that city. Now, but there were some birds which learned how to do it. But then after some time, these birds started dying. But English titmouse started prospering in this. What they found was, behavior-wise, red robin were lonely birds, territorial. Right? Or if on one territory, if a bird sits, the, you know, other birds won't come. Whereas English titmouse were team-based birds. So quickly when one learned how to peel off the foil and take the cream, it taught to the other people also. Right? So within the family, within the team, they taught each other and the survival kept on going. Whereas Red Robin, it did not teach other because they were not social animals. Right? And uh, that's how that perished. So there's a big management lesson that was taken from this in two ways, I would say. Teams prosper, right? Individuals and people who are territorials don't prosper organically. The other thing is, you know, when one generation teaches the other generation, the next generation picks up and prospers. So in organizations, I've seen very, very few leaders who really develop others or consciously as a system organizations encouraging this is not there. So quickly, let's see, leader as a coach, you know, there has, in what we saw, there is a structural shift, you know, the CEO becomes a different person, I'm sorry, CXOs. So a bit of group coaching from the CEO can always help the CXO team in taking over the CEO's responsibility, relieving him to be a watchtower CEO, right? So a model requires this then accelerating this process will come from the internal leaders as coaches, right? Managers can become coaches. Uh, uh, team leaders can become coaches once they are trained. So learning becomes accelerated in this. The organization will go through a transformative change culturally when you're doing this, and it needs to be supported in the transition. Coaching is the leadership style of a transformed culture. This is what John Whitmore says. Coaching is the leadership style of a transformed culture. So very quickly, I'll just give one model which John Whitmore gives and then we will close it for questions. See, he talks about a GROW model, G-R-O-W, this is another acronym. Now, this GROW model, he uses it both for internal performance uh, management as well as individual uh, growth. So I'm going to share with you in both ways how this can be used. So in performance related, the first G stands for goal setting for the period as well as short term and long term. So the boss sits and works on the goal. Then R stands for reality checking to explore the current situation. So he not only talks about setting up and he also sits and talks. So can you examine and say where we are right now, right? Uh, this organization, this team, right? This activity, right? So where you want to go, where you are. Normally, we really don't get into this in our performance uh, management. Then options that the boss sits with. Now, what are the alternative strategies and the course of action that you will take to make the department move there, to make the activity move there? And then what is to be done? When will you do? By whom will it be done? The will to do it, right? The encouragement to do it. So this is one role in performance coaching the boss can do with his team members. 
The other one, individual development could also happen for the professional development of the person. You sit and talk, what do you really want to do? Right? How do you want to develop yourself? And what is the reality where you are right now? And then what are the options, what you can do about? It? And then what will you do? So this is a model of coaching. We call it a grow model. So this can be used as a professional development for the individual also. Right. So uh, we saw that if we have the Watchtower CEO bringing in the information and then working on with this team, which is an autonomous work group with a socio-technical system design, and then you have the relational culture that has been developed and you have the boss, the leader as a coach, the organization is really set up for a rapid organic response. Um, I wouldn't say it's difficult to do this, but it requires the will. And the top management has to be sold for this, need to find the need for it. And then at the leadership, if we sense the change, you know, the organization can make its shifts. So in conclusion, what have we been dealing with is how holistic performance operates, wiring of the phenomenon that is happening in the macro social system up to the job performer through a responsive structure and process. Then the transformative role of the CEO, where he becomes the watchtower CEO, he becomes an organic head. Then the socio-technical system design for the autonomous work teams, which is organic and adaptive. Then relational capital, assuring a responsive and high-performance culture. And the leader becoming the coach. Okay. So now, what I would suggest is that as you've gone through this, if you can also look at your action plan, you know, what would you like to do? Really, you want to cash in on what you have picked up now? Not everything that I shared with you would have been new for you, but collectively all put together, some learning could have definitely taken place. The first benefit that you can get out of this is the shifts that you can think of doing for yourself. And then how do you take it across to the organization? Okay, now I'm open for questions. Uh, the questions which I don't say that I'll be able to answer all questions, but let me see. <laughs> KK, you're going to moderate. Uh, yeah, I see Sudhir, uh, you put up a question. Do you want to just uh, ask the question? Now that we have time, maybe you can unmute yourself and ask the question, Sudhir. Wait, so there's all that. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, KK. Thanks, Thanks Baskaran. KK, are you able to hear me? Yeah, yeah. yeah. You can call me Inba. Inba. Yeah. Okay. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Very insightful, uh, Chief, uh, to hear you and take the uh, thoughts. Uh, so while we, you know, you were on the uh, 4C um, slide. I yeah. had uh, I had a uh, thought that you know what is that uh, normally you know as business leaders uh, we really you know in the times of uncertainty you know mm. what how do we really find early warning signals uh, as an organization as a leader um, a lot of times you know we we look at uh, you know that fear is there uh, mm. but given the industry you know could could suddenly change. And how do I really get into the early warning signals? While some of these, uh, uh, you know, some of those points which you spoke uh, are mm. definitely, you know, are, uh, are are some thoughts which we should really look at. Uh, but my question was that, you know, is there something a mechanism where we really look at uh, early, uh, you know, and early warning signals? Uh, mm. that something drastically going to change. So what I would say is, I mean. Uh, with my limited sense, because uh, uh, such sort of an upheaval of change during my experience, I would say, uh, happened in 91, 92, IT revolution coming in and, uh, you know, the 9-11 and, uh, uh, and, and now it's happening. See, one of the things that I would suggest to be on the lookout was uh, 
you have your business model canvas, right? And uh, they create the touch points in terms of uh, at w- when the phenomenon outside, whatever is happening, in what way can it impact here? Sometimes there will be very slight indications of this because I would say pandemic, you know, has been spoken of by uh, this guy, uh, Bill Gates, for a long time. But none of us really thought that a pandemic can have an impact like this. But whereas looking into history, early part of the 20th century, we saw how it impacted people, lives, and businesses. So what I would say is that's where I'm talking about the CEO being a part of various happenings, uh, taking part in meetings, you know, doing the sensing. But primarily, if you are asking me for a framework, uh, with my limited knowledge, because I don't know how, um, what all can become a framework, but immediately what is available to us is our business model canvas. So from where you can look into, are the things going to be affected? These are the events that are happening. Can this be affected? Right? So okay. connecting the phenomena with what's happening here. Yeah, and, and 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 build on that with the new path in focus, so yeah, that yeah. you know you are you you are really catching up with that if there is a change. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Thanks. Now, uh, thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Now, see, look at the typical thing. Uh, uh, we've gone into actual teams to remote teams now. Correct. Right. And uh, I did a survey. I did a survey across the cities. And I published in my LinkedIn, uh, yeah, LinkedIn. I, I've sent copies to y'all also, where I found that nearly 60 people, 60% of the people were just tolerating working from home. But then given the chance, we said, do you, would you like to get back to office? They said, no, we would like to have a mix of both. Now, these are indications in terms of, is there anything that we can do about it? What do we anticipate? How do we prepare? That what, what are going to be the new norms of uh, remote team operating, virtual teams operating? How do we manage technological aspects in remote teams? So now these are all things that we have to start working and possibly the ones which catch up early will become better in managing uh, and uh, winning the competition. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sabir. Thank you, Sabir. Anyone else? Anyone has a question? Can unmute themselves and ask the question. Uh, I in bad. This is Shrini. Uh, yes, it was a nice presentation. Uh, thank you for it. Thank I have you. a couple of questions. Uh, the first one, um, it, it's on uh, uh, in terms of uh, no uh, the longevity of an organization. We spoke about uh, the performance and the longevity of the organization. How many years, you know, we see organizations now. Uh, yeah. is, do you still think uh, it's a key indicator of performance? Uh, we see organizations being merged, a lot of organizations being acquired one after the other. Uh, is that, uh, in your experience, I just wanted to understand, uh, is still uh, longevity of an organization a key indicator of performance? No, those are, uh, I mean, what governs an organization to be bought over is a different aspect, but I'm talking about in the environment, you know, have they played their game well? See, the thing is, the reason for acquisition, if an organization is plant plateauing and then, you know, they don't know how to work on it and therefore they are conceding is one. There's also uh, aggressive takeovers. So I, I don't know whether we can speak about this in the context of acquisitions and mergers, but within companies, mergers that take place, I would say is a response to what's happening outside. Right? Like for instance, uh, uh, I was working for Lassen Kubra Construction Group. Till the year 1986, it used to be called as Engineering Construction Corporation. It was a separate subsidiary of l &T. It was treated very separately, very uh, different policies and all that. But when the business started expanding, they found that in order to bid internationally and for larger jobs, you know, if, if it becomes totally a part of LNT and LNT is one division is going and competing in the global market, it makes much sense. So no, that merger was a very strategic merger, internal mergers. But otherwise, in terms of one company buying over the other companies and all that, 
whether it comes under the response of plateauing and therefore, uh, I think we have to look at it case to case. Longevity, I will not deal uh, with that aspect, but uh, organizations which have been having an actual death, you know. Got it. Got it. Thank you. Uh, the other one, um, the anticipation, the 4C um, yeah, in the future. Yes. Yeah. Uh, one is anticipating, the other one is how do you persuade it to your uh, shareholders or the board? Uh, uh -huh. What is your thought process into putting forth uh, your anticipation or what do you foresee? You always have your board and I'm sure you have been part of a lot, you know, lot of boards and you would have foreseen a lot of things. Uh, how do you bring things to your board and convince them on what as leaders we anticipate and convince them on your anticipation? You know, board members, actually, if they are shareholders, finally, they want the money, isn't it? So, uh, it, it, I will largely say it is the skill of the CEO and how he's able to present, you know, what can happen if we do not anticipate, right? Uh, now, I would like to ask a question in return in terms of how does the board get involved if you want to anticipate? Because as a part of your function, you go ahead and do this, but how, how do you see the board getting involved in your anticipation? I'm just saying, even this COVID, I'm sure multiple leaders would have definitely had that you know, a persuasion. They would have already foreseen, they would have uh, thought through this. It's definitely been there for the last four or five years. It, they would have definitely read through it. They would have uh, done that. But to this scenario, how do you really convince or how do you really put it across or make sure that we take certain steps? That's where I'm coming from. You you gave examples of uh, those people who have already got few patents, who had uh, already you know, uh, produced certain vaccines uh, or uh, you know, testing kits, all of that. So I'm just coming from that part. In terms of any of those, you know, uh, keeping your antennas open and seeing what's happening outside, but coming for certain plans and putting it outside to your management. That's where I'm coming. Uh, Sidi, the question is very abstract because we don't have a case in hand. Now, do you have any case in hand where a specific plan in anticipation of the COVID was put to the board and the board did not take it? Uh, no, no, I'm, I'm just telling uh, because one of the point, I'm just trying to understand from that perspective because we were talking that even five years before we had uh, yeah. COVID and we were all not able to find it. So that was the reason why could leaders as leaders we are not able to understand that so that's the place i want to understand how do even if we know how can we convince the board or See, leaders that we should take some action number one right now uh, i really don't know whether it's a part of a jd of the ceo to be outside focused because very few ceos i see are really outside focused because most of them are so busy you know in uh, taking care of the increasing the shareholder value that they are only internally looking at it number one number two if you are looking outside and you have got an idea now it's it's not a sudden change you stage it you say that if this 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 happens and i would like to make this this shifts now it's not for an immediate sanction but there will be indicators i anticipate this and i know when it is going to become critical and at the time when it becomes critical, this is what I want to do. And if we don't do this, this will be the consequence. And I'm presenting this to you. Can I have your approval? Now, if we are very clear about our presentation in terms of what's the damage it can do, right? Then I suppose your board will be able to understand. Right? So one of the skill of the CEO is to how to you know, communicate to people who really don't know the business in full. You know, they know their own areas or they just invested money and they put you responsible for it. So how do you convince? But you have to have a model very clear and say, what are the consequences of not doing it? And when exactly would I like to trigger it? So if you have a concrete plan, I suppose you can sense it. Got it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Srini. Anyone else? Comments? Thoughts? Questions? Uh, hi, this is Sunil. Yes, Sunil. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, it's been a fantastic session. Thank uh, you. Yeah, one, one question that I, I actually been thinking for some time now is that, you know, 
what is exactly that one has to do to constantly challenge um, already existing very strong beliefs and assumptions. Mm. Right. So, what what is that one should constantly do? I mean, how how do you challenge that? Now, are you clear about the existing beliefs? How it is negatively impacting the organization? Um, let's say not really. No. Supposing we pick up models for this. Now, if I were you, this is what I will do. The, I will have a solution for what is the alternative and how it can impact, and what is the present. And what is the harm can do? Right? And if we have this very clearly you know, and then present it, and I think buying it will be much easier because people, see, the thing is, when people grow into an organization, it is very unjust to expect that the CEO is an all-knowing God because he's been good in one function and good in people, uh, I mean, understanding people, and then slowly he comes up to that. If we give the right convincing rest, on a model to them, I suppose they should be able to buy. But then, first of all, when I raise it, I have to be clear what I am talking about. Does that answer your question? Um, sure. So, because uh, revisiting the culture is very important because. Uh, now, if there has been a toxic culture in the organization, now it's all the more dangerous now that we are working on it. Now, that toxicity will be getting into the virtual systems also, and it will be very difficult to manage. So I, the question that you ask is very relevant because we need to look into cultures to, and challenge things which are not working, dysfunctional ones. You need to look at it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And if any of you want to have separate sessions with respect to your organization, you want to have a one-on-one -on -one to understand, you know, a brief coaching session will be available. Uh, maybe you can book a time of one hour uh, and, uh, you know, uh, Emerge Way will be able to tell you what are the commercials for that. And you want to get an in-depth understanding and create an action plan for your organization, I'll be available. Uh, Mostly, I should be available on January. Yeah, so, if anybody wants it, you can tell in advance. Thank you. Any other thoughts? Any other questions? Anybody else? Uh, uh, sorry, uh, one final question, uh, Inba. Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, they say that uh, it is lonely at the top. But oh, not... can, can you hear me now? Yeah, it's it's a little uh, distorted. Say that again. Uh, Say so. uh, yeah, are you able to hear me now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Perfect, perfect. Now, I was I was just uh, asking, they say that it is very lonely at the top. Yes. Uh, uh, how much of this do you believe and what would be your, you know, probably your suggestions to this team? Uh... The thing is, uh, uh, I, I think many times it becomes lonely at the top uh, because we don't want to be transparent. If you get into the depth of that relational capital, developing the relational capital, uh, you know, you have a trustworthy team with you. Uh, why should that loneliness be? If you can come out sharing with them, right? So we are social beings, but then the techno culture. You know, the technical system makes us lonely at the top. But if we are able to share, that's, num that's number one. Number two is probably we are at a paradigm where other people are not able to appreciate because the paradigm that they belong to and the paradigm that I belong to are very different because it is one up. Then it also it becomes my responsibility to coach them and then bring them up to that level. The other thing I would say, if you're really concerned about loneliness, uh, I would say get a coach, hire a coach, you know, where you have a sort of an accountability partner, a person where you will be able to share, um, at least for a brief while, you know, and work on that. But depending upon the level of your 
growth, you know, and your understanding of the environment, uh, the loneliness could di differ. Uh, and more so, if people are not able to connect with that, the loneliness becomes much higher. But I would say, largely, we can deal with it, but we cannot completely eradicate it. Thank you. Uh, uh, Inba, Subir here again. Yes, Subir. Uh, do you advise uh, organizations to really set up some metrics or some kind of a coach, coaching sessions, mm -hmm. which should actually really look at uh, from a cultural uh, point of view? It just mm -hmm. came to me that a mindset to see opportunity in uh, uncertainty, you know, because that's something uh, um, possibly, you know, do you advise that? Because that's a mindset uh, which needs to be shifted, you know, while uh, we, we spoke about uncertainty. Now, do you, yeah, do you yeah. really put an advice uh, to business leader to promote that as a part of the cultural uh, movement within or the motion within the or organizations? I would definitely say yes for that because it's not just to anticipate and uh, avoid trouble, but also, you know, to look for opportunities and expand just as the way 3M had been doing and all that, that you know, participation of the employees in the organization, creating it as a culture. So both ways they look at the opportunity as well as, and then the anticipation of things that can uh, go a little different. Definitely, I would say it would be an advantage if you can do that, but then it has to start from the top. Yeah. Yeah. Anything yeah. has to start from the top. And, uh, you know, leaders create something called collective consciousness, right? You create a field and depending upon the mind of the leader, right, and mind of the top team, the, the collective consciousness will spread across the organization. You can dictate that. Right? And you can change that. So concretely, if the top management together get a knitted mind and they create a culture within themselves, a culture of trust, you know, a culture of empathy, you know, so, so a culture of fairness. We saw all those uh, five components. You know, okay. definitely that culture will spread across and what you say will also become a part of the organization. I've seen this happen in organization. Uh, you know, when the top management makes a difference, it just seeps across the organization right up to the bottom level. There is something beyond mechanistic and socialistic thinking. Absolutely. Something like Absolutely. spiritual, you know, that happens. And uh, I've really, really seen this happen. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Inba. Thank you. Okay, if no, no questions, we can bring it to a close. So, if no last question, so yeah. yeah. Thank you, everyone, for your uh, patience and uh, understanding. Thank you, Inba. Thank you. As usual, just taking it so nicely, you know, like several hours you know, due to the screen to understand what you have to contribute. Excellent. Thank you very much for that. Thank you. Uh, all of you, I'll be sending out uh, a feedback form. Uh, I'd appreciate if you can just fill that up and send it back to me ASAP. Uh, also, you know, if you had any thoughts uh, or any questions that you couldn't ask during the session, please put it in there and we'll try to address those questions as well. Sure. Thank you very much. Thank you and all the very best to all of you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Inbal. Thank you. Thanks again. Thank you. Thanks, Inbal. Thanks, KK. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Inbal. Thank you, Sini. Thank you, Krishna. Bye. Thank you.